This is part six in a series of videos in which I am restoring this ASR33 teletype machine. In the first videos in this series, I stripped it down into its major sub-assemblies. And since then, I've been going through the assemblies one by one and refurbishing them, restoring, repairing them. So I started with a printer unit. Uh, that's mostly done. I've got a few small jobs left to do on that. Uh, and in the previous video, I went over the keyboard, stripped that down, uh, restored the keys, cleaned all those up. They're in fairly poor state. Uh, as you can see now, they are fairly good. And uh, I've been putting a lot of time into cleaning up the casework, the plastic. It was in fairly poor cosmetic condition, had some fairly deep scratches on it. So I polished all those out and uh, the rest of it was just uh, old and uh, looked fairly poor. So. I've given it all a, a very good uh, clean and polish and it's uh, come up extremely nicely as you can see. So I've restored all the plastic. I've still got a little bit of work to do but as you can see it's mostly done. Um, polished up and cleaned the clear top which you can see has also come up uh, extremely nicely and um, polished out all the scratches so that's now looking uh, extremely good. Um, polished up the uh, chrome parts and they're in exceptional condition. I've carried out most of the adjustments that uh, it initially needs to get it to the point where I can start testing this and as you can see I have uh, just temporarily uh, screwed it all back together again at least reassembled it to this point. It's not working yet I still have to go through the electronics pack uh, at the moment I've invested about a hundred hours in this restoration. I think I'm about halfway through, uh, another hundred hours or so to go depending on what I find. But it is coming up extremely nicely and I think it will uh, clean up extremely well and I think it will be a, a very nice example of one of these machines. Uh, I will then have the base to uh, look at and restore, uh, but I'll do that separately. Uh, but as I say in this video the next step is to look at the punch so I'll get this out of the way we'll get the punch on the bench and see what needs to be done to get that working okay so here we have the punch this is how it came out of the machine so it's, it seems to be in reasonable condition I can't see any obvious damage there is a, a fixing missing off the plastic part but other than that it seems okay. I haven't looked at this in any detail, so I don't know what state the punch pins are in. Um, but the first thing, uh, as ever, is to get this cleaned up. Um, it's not too bad, but it's just sort of dirty and grimy and uh, needs a good clean so we can uh, see what's going on with it and try and figure out what work it needs. Uh, it seems to be reasonably free. Some bits seem to be a little bit um, sluggish in moving, but other than that, it does all seem to move uh, the way it should do so I'll go and get this cleaned up and then we'll try and figure out what condition it's in. Okay I've given the punch a really good clean uh, as you can see I've removed the uh, chad chute and I've uh, done that so I could uh, look at the uh, punch pins under a microscope just checking the condition of the end of the pins to make sure that um, they're in good order and uh, were going to be able to punch the paper okay and they all look fine. Um, there's not a huge amount of wear in this punch, I don't think it's had a massive amount of use but um, it was kind of partially seized, though it wouldn't turn very freely and the um, backspace key wouldn't uh, rotate the, the drive uh, sprocket so uh, I had to free that up. It's now all turning reasonably freely, I haven't lubricated it yet so it does need to be um, cleaned a bit more and then given a good oiling lubrication um, but I just thought I'd explain briefly how this works. These are uh, quite clever machines and uh, as ever there are complications in them brought about by the nature of the way they, uh, the machines used and some of the features that it has. Um, but just to briefly explain how this works what we have here are eight bars that attach to the selector bars on the print mechanism so if you recall from the print mechanism, the coded value that's sent to it ends up on eight uh, code bars or selector bars. And they all end up in one of two positions, depending on whether it's a zero or a one for that bit. This hooks onto the end of those bars. So each of these 
uh, extension bars will take on the position of the selector bars in the uh, printer unit, so it will just duplicate the, uh, the value that's on the printer bars. That in turn causes these um, slide bars to move across. Now if you look, hopefully you can see this, there is a tab that pucks down from the uh, bar and there's one of these for each of the bars there are, and each one is lined up with one of the uh, rocker bars you can see here. Now if the bar is in this position then it allows the rocker bar to move freely including moving upwards. But if it's moved across then when this rocker bar moves down the tab can move on top of it and as you can see now it's captured in the down position so it can't come back up. If I push this back across you'll see this bar pop up. So that in turn moves the rocker lever down and holds it down or allows it to come up. Those levers are these levers and what we have here is an arrangement where again I don't know if you can see this is a bar that goes across here it's pivoted at this point and the far end of it is controlling the punch pin so these silver pins on the end are the punch pins that make the holes in the paper. If this bar moves upwards it pushes the pin up and punches a hole through the tape. So in other words to punch a hole in the tape what we need to do is pull this silver bar the one with a kind of hook on it downwards and to do that what we do is this bottom portion that has the hook on it is captured by this portion of the rocker bar. Whether that occurs or not for each of the rocker bars is determined by the position of the selector bar. So if it's allowed to capture this um, cam bar, there's one for each of the pins, then when this ultimately is uh, moved down it causes the uh, rocker bar up here to move up at this far end and punch a hole in the paper. If it's not captured then the corresponding cam bar does not move and the pin does not move up and it does not punch a hole in the paper. So in other words by setting different positions for these eight selector bars we can determine which of the holes is going to be punched. The only exception is the sprocket hole and that is always punched. So that's the smaller of the holes you can see. It's a smaller hole in the paper that's made. Uh, but that's punched uh, every time uh, a row is selected because the sprocket hole is always required. The other part of the mechanism is responsible for advancing the paper and it does that through this kind of um, ratchet arrangement. And the whole thing is driven through a single uh, rocking lever. So these bars connect to the, um, the selector bars on the printer and then this bar connects to, a, uh, to the rocking selector on the printer through a link and then it just moves backwards and forwards. And that action of moving backwards and forwards performs all the necessary operations including moving the pins up where required to punch the holes but also advancing the paper. So as you can see when I move the bar back and forth it turns the ratchet wheel and that advances the paper and at the same time you can see the pins moving up in response to me moving this lever. Still a bit tight at the moment but you can see hopefully what's going on. Now, it's actually quite a bit more complex than that because there are certain other requirements. Now, first we've got this arrangement here, which is the backspace key. So when this is in the machine, which I'll show another time, there are four buttons that's, that protrude through the machine. And each one of those encroaches on one of these four levers. Uh, one of them is to release the paper tension. So this arrangement here is what uh, causes the paper to be pinched between this serrated roller and another roller underneath. So the paper is trapped between these so that when this uh, is rotated it pushes the paper through the punch. 
We then have this, which is the backspace, and this just causes this ratchet to move backwards. So each time you push it down, it moves back one tooth, and that causes the paper to move backwards through the uh, punch, if you want to backspace the paper for any reason. And then we have the on and the off buttons, uh, which en uh, engage and disengage the uh, mechanism from the drive. So when it's in the off position, it doesn't do anything, and when it's in the on position, it uh, punches uh, tape. It's actually uh, even more complex than that because there are other options. One is for auto start and stop of the punch, depending on the code that's selected on the code bars. And then one that's a bit harder to explain, there is a feature on the ASR, in fact most teletypes, called answer back. And it's when it's triggered by a particular code, um, usually figures D is the code that's um, used to trigger it. That causes the machine to go into answer back mode when it sends um, a particular code back if the options fitted on the ASR it sends a particular code back to the calling station. However if you're punching a tape and it encounters that code or if you're playing the tape back and it encounters that code you don't want it to trigger that function. You don't want it to send the answer back out in response to that code if you're just playing a tape back. So what happens is these two cams at the back are on this particular code of course that um, is used for that uh, function and when the machine's running normally the machine is triggered by that code to sending the answer back code back um, but when you feed that code into the punch these two rockers are engaged and if they're engaged along with the code, the figures D code, then that causes the figures D code to be changed to a figures code. In other words, it changes the code to something that's not going to trigger the answer back unit. It is an option on the punches, um, but it does complicate the uh, punch design. There are a few other options on here as well, as I say, the uh, auto start stop and that sort of thing. Uh, but it does make the punch more complex than it would otherwise be. Uh, having said that, they are relatively easy to work on. If you strip them down, they're a bit of a pain. You need to keep very careful track of where the, vi the various springs are attached, and they are a bit of a pain to get on. It's quite easy to reassemble them, but some of the springs are very difficult to get back in place. Uh, and also, if you take these apart, make sure you get the, pun the uh, pins back in the right holes. In theory, they should all be the same. Um, but it's best to get them back where you put them from and in particular you must make sure that the sprocket hole pin is in the right uh, location because it's a different sized hole in the die plate. Uh, also you've got to make sure there's no excessive wear in this. Like I said I don't think it's had a lot of use so this doesn't look too bad. Uh, these felt pads here are for lubrication so we need to impregnate those with oil and there's another one in here. It's kind of hard to see but there's another one of those arrangements uh, with felt pads that's for lubrication on these rockers and they need to be properly lubricated otherwise it will uh, wear out extremely quickly. These are moving at a fairly high speed when the machine's running. So that's it, it seems to be in good condition. What I'm going to do now is uh, just lubricate it, uh, make sure that it turns freely. It's a bit too tight at the moment, I need it to turn uh, a bit more freely than this. It requires quite a lot of force to move it uh, and that's far more than it should need. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll put a piece of tape in, trigger a few values manually and make sure it can punch some tape. Assuming it works okay, uh, then I'll put it back in the machine. But I'll lubric what I'll do now is I'll lubricate this, put a piece of tape in and then just show you uh, how it punches the uh, holes uh, in response to the rocker being moved and also how it advances the, uh, the tape. But I'll get it lubricated first. Incidentally, this arrangement here is um, adjustment for the, the, the tension on the, um, the pinch roller. So the higher up the spring, then the more uh, pressure there is on the pinch roller and the harder it grips the paper. Okay, so I'll get some oil on this and then um, see if it can actually punch any holes. Okay, so that's the punch lubricated. I've worked the mechanism back and forth a few times and uh, you probably can't tell on the camera but it is now much freer. 
no weird noises, feels uh, quite nice and free and uh, all the parts that should be moving seem to be moving. Um, what I'll do now is feed a piece of paper through it and just demonstrate it uh, punching. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is um, if you're watching this hole when I pull the lever you'll see a, there's kind of a, a bar that pops up and that is the nudge lever, what's called the nudge lever. Uh, when these are punching at a uh, fairly high speed they need to move the tape, punch it, move the tape again, punch it, so it's a start stop action with the tape. But the paper reels are quite big and heavy when they're full and so they have a lot of inertia and so to prevent uneven spacing of the holes that would be caused by this sudden snatching action if it had to suddenly accelerate the paper reel it's got this nudge um, arrangement and what that does is it builds up a loop of paper um, behind the punch head and then when the punch wants to advance the paper using the pinch roller the only real mass of paper it has to suddenly move is in this little loop that's between the pinch roller and where the nudge loop is and that way it doesn't have to suddenly spin up the, um, the paper reel. Okay so I'll feed a piece of um, tape through Okay, so it feeds in from the back. We need to get it past the pinch roller, so we have to press down on the release lever. And then it goes through into the uh, punch head. And then, try to get hold of this, not much I'll hold on to really, but um, if we do partial steps, you'll see it will advance the tape. I'm only moving the lever halfway. Now if I'm bringing the lever all the way forward, it will punch all eight holes. Um, these are in the mark um, position when they are in this direction and because they're under spring tension they all automatically go to that position when this is not in the machine. So if I pull this lever all the way forward it will punch all, or should punch all eight data holes and the sprocket hole. So I'll pull that forward now, push it back and I'll just drive it out a little bit. So you can see it's punched all the data holes, nice round clean holes and a nice round clean sprocket hole. So as I said, uh, I did inspect the pins and they look good and this is borne out by the quality of the holes. So if the machine wants to punch a particular code, what it does is it just pulls one of these levers across or one or more of these levers across to set the code that it wants. There's one of these for each of the eight data holes. The sprocket hole is of course always punched. And so if I now push one of these across and try punching again, You can see that it has now not punched that end hole because I was holding the uh, selection lever across. And that's how it selects the code that it wants to punch, it just sets it up on these uh, levers. So as you can see it appears to be working fine. Um, it's all nice and clean, I shall work it back and forth a little bit more, re-lubricate it and then this is ready to fit back into the machine. So as you can see they're fairly easy to work on and because they come out of the machine so easily um, if you do have a problem with them it's normally fairly easy to sort out what's causing it you can just uh, work the lever back and forth and see what's not uh, doing what it's supposed to but, uh, okay i'll get this fitted back into the machine and in the next video we'll look at the tape reader